in any case, this all comes at a very interesting time, this great push to get the Christian church in particular to accept theistic evolution comes at a, a kind of ironic time because major figures in evolutionary biology are now expressing profound doubts precisely about the creative power of the mutation natural selection mechanism, the alleged cause of the major biological change over the history of life. And that, that's what I really want to focus on too in this talk is what is causing the, those major innovations? What's causing the new form, the new biological forms to arise? That's the central question of biology. Evolutionary biology is the central question that Darwin himself uh, addressed. Now, a number of us here in the room, uh, and by the way, we have not only the four speakers tonight, but we had a late uh, edition of Doug Axe, who is also a contributor to the book, and um, uh, about whose work I'll be discussing in my talk, so it's a little bit awkward. We should have Doug up here talking about his own uh, groundbreaking work, but he'll join us for the Q&A afterwards. Anyway, Doug, Ann, Gager, and I, and about two dozen other proponents of intelligent design attended the Royal Society Conference that was held in November of 2016. The conference was called by leading evolutionary theorists who were um, essentially w wanting to A, evaluate the standard textbook theory of neo-Darwinism, the modern form of Darwin's theory, but also to say it's time to move beyond this theory. The, and we need to start exploring new mechanisms, new processes, new something that can explain major innovation in the history of life because many of them have acknowledged in their own scientific writings that the mutation natural selection mechanism lacks creative power. It explains the small scale variations very well. It doesn't explain where major new forms of life come from. It explains the minor changes in the shape and size of the finch beaks, but it doesn't explain where birds come from in the first place. Now, the first talk at this conference was, was really striking. It was by a leading Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Müller. His talk was about the explanatory deficits of the modern synthesis. The modern synthesis is just a uh, technical term for neo-Darwinism. And Müller listed a number of deficits, but I want to focus on three. They were the first three out of the chute. He said the modern neo-Darwinism, with its reliance on the mutation selection mechanism, does not explain the origin of phenotypic complexity. That is the large-scale uh, features of animal, animal bodies and anatomy. Uh, secondly, he said it doesn't explain the origin of anatomical novelty. New organs, new structures, new body plans as they arise in the history of life. And thirdly, he said it doesn't explain non-gradual modes of transition. What he's talking about is abrupt appearance in the fossil record, including an event that I uh, have written about extensively, the Cambrian explosion, which is the origin of the first animal life. In our new book on theistic evolution, um, there's a new player in our cast of characters. His name is Gunter Beckley. He's recently uh, publicly declared his sympathies for the theory of intelligent design. He's been rewarded with... Uh, 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 and he's been erased from Wikipedia. He's uh, also been asked to leave the museum where he was long curator. But he nevertheless is a really high-powered European paleontologist, leading scientist, and insect paleontologist. And he and I co-author an article in the book about not only the abrupt appearance of the first animal groups, but also the abrupt appearance of 17 other such events in the history of life. Uh, the first mammals, the first flowering plants, the first reptiles, the first, it's, the first birds. There are all these different radiations or revolutions. And this is a major puzzle for evolutionary theory. The picture of the history of life in the fossil record doesn't look like that gradually branching tree at all. It looks like a series of abrupt appearances. In any case, the main thing I'd like to focus on tonight is this question of the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism. Because we have this kind of irony in that major figures in evolutionary biology are saying things like, neo-Darwinism has no theory of the generative. It doesn't have a mechanism that's creative. This is a, 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 an earlier book by Gerd Muller with a co-author, Stuart Newman, published by a little known science press, MIT, anyone heard of that? Yeah, um, on the, called On the Origin of Organismal Form. And Muller and Newman argue that uh, while the mutation selection mechanism is still orthodoxy in all the textbooks, that people in the know within evolutionary biology are aware that it offers very little by way of creative power. And yet at the same time, we have leading spokesmen and women, spokespersons for 
the evolutionary creationist view or the theistic evolutionist view saying that this very mechanism is the means by which God created. The gradual process of evolution was crafted and governed by God to create the diversity of all life on earth. This is Deborah Harzma, the now president of the Biologos uh, Foundation. Uh, she goes on to say in the same article that evolutionary creationists accept that natural selection and other evolutionary mechanisms acting over long periods of time eventually result in major changes in body structure. Some people call this macroevolution. So the mutation selection mechanism and other related mechanisms are thought to be the means by which God created. And yet at the same time, we have people like Muller and Newman saying there is, that neo-Darwinism with its reliance on those same mechanisms lacks a, a theory of the generative. It doesn't have a mechanism that's genuinely creative. So we have this kind of irony that just as leading evolutionary biologists are explicitly acknowledging a crisis in the explanatory power of neo-Darwinism and its mutation selection mechanism, Christians in the sciences and other faith groups are pushing to get the Christian church and they're outside the Christian church, maybe Jewish groups, others, to accept evolutionary mechanisms as the means by which God created. But if the mechanism isn't, isn't creative, why attribute God's creativity to it? See the puzzle? Now what I'd like to show in the time we have left, now this is just a quote from one of the organizers of that conference at the Royal Society, says so there are hundreds of evolutionary scientists who aren't creationists, who contend that natural selection is politics, not science, by which uh, Susan Mazur really meant uh, that it lacks this power we were talking about. Now, I'd like to, I've got a, a heading four challenges to the creative power of natural selection. I don't think we'll get through all four, but I'm gonna talk about a few of them. I want you to understand a little of the science about why the scientists are disputing the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism, and therefore why we uh, might be skeptical about claims from Christians in the sciences that, w that other people of faith are under a kind of intellectual obligation to accept this mechanism as the means of God's creativity. Okay, well, I think the, the very first problem that natural selection and random mutation face is the problem of the origin of genetic information. Um, in, in an event like the Cambrian explosion where you have a lot of new forms of animal life arising very abruptly, there is, um, now we understand, a, 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 a deeper problem than just the missing ancestral fossils in the lower strata. And that problem is what mechanism or process could have built all that new form so apparently quickly in the history of life? Um, I used to ask my students a question, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you give it? Play Ben Stein up here, anyone? Code, yes, thank you. Code, a program, information, instructions. All of these are the right answer. And we've come to appreciate that since the 1950s and 60s during a period in the history of science that's now known as the molecular biological revolution. Watson and Crick are key figures in this. They elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953. Four years later, Crick on his own realizes that the famed double helix structure with the different chemical subunits along the inside, known as bases or nucleotide bases, uh, is, is actually an information-carrying molecule. And that these chemical bases are functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written text, or we could say the zeros and ones in, a, in, in, in software. That is to say, it's not the, 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 the molecular structure of those bases or their atomic weight or their other attributes per se, it's their arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention that we now call the genetic code that allows them to convey information. Information as it happens for building the crucial proteins and protein machines that keep cells alive. This, this idea of Crick's was known as the sequence hypothesis. It's the sequential arrangement of these chemical subunits that allow them to convey instructions or information for building proteins. Now, I've got a little visual aid. Some of you have seen it before. I was taking some ribbing before the, uh, the talk started, but it's, uh, these are uh, snaplock beads. Ages two to four, it said on the box, okay. Um, the, 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 the DNA, in case this isn't familiar, um, provides instructions for arranging 
the subunits of the proteins called amino acids. If these, if these subunits are arranged just right, then the forces between them will cause them to fold into a particular three-dimensional structure, shape, that will allow the, 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 the protein to do an important job in the cell. And proteins do all the important jobs in the cell. They're like the toolbox, where their shape allows them to do different functions. In a toolbox, you might have a wrench, hammer, pliers, and the, the different uh, form of those, of those tools allows them to do different jobs. And the same thing is true in life. You have this information directing the construction of these crucial protein uh, structures and machines that allow cells to stay alive. Now, I like to call this the, the DNA enigma. And the DNA enigma is not the structure of the DNA molecule. Watson and Crick figured that out. It's not what the information in the DNA does or where the information resides. We now know that as well. The DNA enigma is something else. Where did the code come from? Where did that information come from? Now, the Darwinian answer to that question is that the code is the result of random changes in the sequence of, of chemical subunits or chemical characters that convey the information. But as we've realized that the code inside the DNA is like the code we use in computer software or like a written text, that answer seems to be less and less plausible. Imagine taking um, a, a functional sequence on the bottom, like time and tide wait for no man, and then beginning to change it at random by what we might think of as mutations. It doesn't take very long before the changes are going to accumulate and destroy the original readability and, and meaning of that sentence, law, and, and that will happen long before you get to another, an, another sentence, right? It's very similar with computer code. You start introducing random changes to zeros and ones, and you get bugs and glitches, you don't get a new operating system or algorithm or software program, right? And so a very similar problem attends the Darwinian mechanism because though natural selection is not a random process, it is preserving things that correlate to survival value, the random mutations are random, ineliminably random. You can't get rid of the random element in it. And so that mechanism is going to degrade functional information long before any new information arises, okay? Now, there's a mathematical reason for that. We can kind of think of randomly changing and then getting a new sequence. So random changes tend to degrade specified or functional information. Now, there's a reason for this that's mathematical. In the English language, for every 12 letters that are functional and meaningful, there are 100 trillion other ways to arrange those same characters. So as you start changing things at random, you're much more likely, overwhelmingly more likely, to land in the non-functional abyss, to find a non-functional combination, than you are to find a new functional combination, okay? Now, to make a kind of long story short, it turns out that the very same thing, the same thing is true in the DNA and protein case. If you think of the ACs, Gs, and Ts along the DNA spine, there, and you take a section of the DNA that's long enough to build a new functional protein, the ratio of non-functional sequences to functional sequences is even more prohibitively small than in the case of the English language. And my colleague Doug Axe has actually done the definitive work on this in his 12-year-long research project that he performed at Cambridge University in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I'm gonna skip a few slides so don't, don't get dizzy. I'm going to go right to his conclusion, which is that the ratio of the functional combinations of amino acids to all the non-functional combinations is not 1 over 10 to the 12th, which is the, the, the ratio we just looked at in the English case, but it's about 1 over 10 to the 77th power for a relatively short 150 amino acid length protein. Most proteins are much longer than that, so the problem is typically much worse. Most proteins are on average about 300 amino acids. So the way to think of this would be something like, um, I've got an illustration, uh, a bike lock. Imagine you're a thief and you want to steal a nice bicycle out in front of Sutherland Hall and you encounter a bike lock with four dials. How many possibilities do you have to search? Well, as it turns out, not as many as even that 12 letter case with the English language. You've got uh, about 10,000 possibilities. But um, that's enough to defeat most of us if we have a limited amount of time. You spin the dials and you're gonna, you know, you've got to be really persistent. 
but I've done the math on this, and if you have 15 hours and you spin one dial per 10 seconds, in 15 hours you can get more than 5,000, at which case your odds of success are gonna be better than 50-50, and so in that case, the chance hypothesis, the hypothesis that the thief will succeed, is more likely to be true than false, if the thief has 15 hours. <laughs> but what if the thief encounters a lock like this, with 10 dials? Well, now if the thief lives to be 100, does nothing his whole life, but sample different combinations, one every 10 seconds, takes no potty breaks, has no dates, never goes to sleep at night, never eats a meal, the thief is only gonna sample about 3%, I've done the math, of the total number of combinations, the 10 to the 10th possibilities. Now in that case, it's overwhelmingly more likely that a random search will fail than it is that it will, than it will succeed. And so the question in the life case is, and if that's the case, by the way, notice how this kind of shifts to being a way of testing uh, the chance hypothesis. If it's, overwhelming more, if it's overwhelmingly more likely that a random search will fail than succeed, it's overwhelmingly more likely that the chance hypothesis is false than true. Because if you're a betting person, you say, well, he's gonna succeed in finding, the thief is gonna succeed in finding the combination, you're more likely to be wrong than right. So your hypothesis is more likely to be false than true. Okay, now let's go back to what, what Dr. Axe found in his research. That the search space, when we're talking about genes and proteins, is vastly in excess, exponentially much larger than the, 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 the case with the, the 10 dials on the lock. And it's even vast in relation to all the number of opportunities you would have to search the space in the known history of life on Earth, because there have only been about 10 to the 40th organisms. So 10 to the 40th over 10 to the 77 is 1 over 10 to the 37th. That ends up being the size of the search space that you can sample in 3.85 billion years. So if you can only sample a tiny little smidge in the search space, you're more likely to fail in finding the part you want than you are in succeeding. And therefore the hypothesis that that's how it happened is more likely to be false and true. Bottom line, the mutation selection mechanism is not a plausible means of generating new biological information. Next, next subject. It's not, the, but the problem isn't just that the mutation selection mechanism can't generate a single new gene. It's that to build a new form of animal life, we need what are called de gene, developmental gene regulatory networks, which are integrated systems of genes that interact to, in effect, um, regulate the timing and expression of specific parts of the genome so that just as the organism is developing, going through cell division, the right proteins are generated or, 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 or expressed in order to service those new types of cells. It's all beautifully choreographed, and when scientists, including uh, the scientists who did this work were at Caltech, when they mapped this out, when they mapped out the functional relationships between the different genes and the gene products, the proteins that in turn bound to other parts of the genome to turn some parts on and leave other parts suppressed and then yeah, turn other parts on at just the right time, they found that it looked like an integrated circuit. It was a complex, functionally integrated, information processing system. So you don't just need one gene and one protein to make an animal, you need a, gene, a, a, a developmental gene regulatory network. Now here's the rub. It turns out when the scientist, uh, Eric Davidson, who's recently passed away, but a, a genius Caltech scientist, mapped out these systems, he discovered something else about them, and that is that you can't change them very much at all without the organism uh, ceasing to undergo the process of development. In other words, development would shut down if you start changing the core elements of these gene regulatory networks. But since we know that these gene regulatory networks are necessary to build animal body plans, to get a new animal body plan to arise from an old animal body plan means we'd have to have a new gene regulatory network which would mean we'd have to alter, transform, or change that initial gene regulatory network, but that it's exactly what our laboratory work tells us does not and cannot happen. Without animal death, and if you have animal death, the evolutionary process ceases. So you've got a real problem. This problem has not been solved, it's not been addressed by leading evolutionary biologists, except to say, uh, except in the case of Davidson, to say that neo-Darwinism is a catastrophic error in thinking because it cannot solve this problem. I put this problem to 
Dr. Harzman in a Four Views book and an in-print exchange, and she passed on the opportunity to try to answer it. Um, it's simply not addressed by proponents of either theistic or um, mainstream naturalistic forms of evolution. One other problem, and this one is really delicious, and it's, it's caught the attention of a lot of very serious evolutionary biologists. It turns out that as important as DNA is for the production of proteins, which needs to service all different types of cells, that DNA alone cannot generate a new animal body plan, a new animal architecture either. DNA makes proteins, but proteins have to be organized into biosynthetic pathways that characterize different types of cells. Different types of cells have to be organized to form specific kinds of tissues. Specific tissues have to be organized to form specific kinds of organs. And organs and tissues have to be organized again to form a high-level body plan. So the DNA is providing the low-level instructions for the, in a sense, the lower-level components, but those components and those above it have to be organized again with new sources of information that we now know are not solely present in the, on the DNA strand, in the DNA molecule, in the genome. So to be, be a little bit like uh, in a computer system today where you might have um, information being used in a CAD CAM system where you take information and you use it to build some mechanical uh, parts so we can have assembly instructions for building an electrical component. Well, that's pretty good to use information to build the electrical component, but you need more instructions to place the component on the circuit board in the right place and the other components as well, and then you need additional assembly instructions to put those circuit boards in the right place within, in relation to all the other parts of the computer. So you need these higher level assembly instructions, and we now know that those instructions are not stored on the DNA molecule. Now, where they are is a question of open research. In my book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, I identify four known sources of what are called epigenetic or ontogenetic information, information beyond the genome. But here's the rub for evolutionary theory. The neo-Darwinian mechanism places the creative engine assigns the creative engine for the evolutionary process to the mutations. They're the variations. They're what change things, right? They're what could generate the novelty. But those mutations, in the best of cases, even if they could solve Doug Axe's probability problem, even if they could search those vast spaces to find those little needles and haystacks, would, in the best case, only generate a new protein. That information on the DNA strand at the lowest level in the biological hierarchy will not arrange by itself the proteins into cell types, the cell types into tissues, the tissues into organs, the organs and tissues into body plants. And so what that means is that what's called body plan morphogenesis, the origin of new form, cannot in principle be explained by the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Because the neo-Darwinian mechanism, best case, is only going to give you new proteins. You can mutate it till the cows come home indefinitely, infinitely over an infinite long time period, and you will not get this higher level structure which is necessary to build a new body plan. And it was for exactly that reason that Muller and Newman, in their book on the origin of organismal form, said mutation and selection is not an adequate theory of the generative. It can't explain high level form the origin of body plans. And they listed in a table of unsolved problems for contemporary evolutionary theory the problem of the origin of form. When I saw that, I thought, stop press. That's the very question that Darwin allegedly solved. And yet we have this irony that we have people in the theistic world now trying to effectively baptize Darwin. Now, at this Royal Society conference, um, a number of, of the proponents of newer evolutionary models were there. Also, thank you very much, also uh, proposing new mechanisms to complement, supplement, uh, replace the neo-Darwinian mechanism. But we found, as, and I have evaluated a number of these, both in the new book with Ann Gager, we had a long article on the post-neo-Darwinian evolutionary uh, models and mechanisms, and in my book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, that while the, many of these mechanisms and new theories had um, advantages that old line neo-Darwinism does not, they cut, broke new ground in biology, they highlighted new processes that are real process, processes, they did not solve the fundamental information problem. An illustration I highlight at the bottom, natural genetic engineering. It's the brainchild of a brilliant molecular biologist or cell biologist at the University of Chicago, Jim Shapiro. 
he has shown that the mutations that often occur in living systems are not random at all. They're under what he calls algorithmic control. And the, it looks as though the, the organism has the capacity to, it has a kind of pre-programmed adaptive capacity so that when environmental stresses of various kinds affect the organism, the organism has the ability to activate certain genes and suppress others and to adapt within limits to those stressors. All that is very cool biology. It is non-Darwinian, we agree. But Shapiro leaves one question unanswered. Where does the programming come from, that pre-programming? And that's what interests us in the intelligent design movement, because we think that information in our experience always arises from an intelligent source, and none of these new models have shown otherwise. In fact, one of the organizers for the conference, Susan Mazur, for the Royal Society Conference, wrote afterwards that it was characterized by a lack of momentousness. Very trenchant critiques of established neo-Darwinian theory, but nothing new to replace it that solves the problems that inspired the conference in the first place. Now, you might be interested just to know how this critique that we're offering of the creative power of mutation and selection has been received by a mainstream scientist, mainstream evolutionary biologist. Um, some of the critique that we make in uh, the book Theistic Evolution um, echoes some things that I argued in Darwin's Doubt. When my book came out in 2013, I had a number of frivolous reviews initially, but then I got a very serious review in Science in September after a June release. And the scientist there, Charles Marshall, who reviewed it was critical, respectful, but critical, and I was thrilled more at the criticism than at the respect. Because he tried to, he did address the main argument of the book head on, and he said that Meyer's case depends upon the claim that the origin of new animal body plans requires vast amounts of novel genetic information. He said, in fact, that's not our present understanding. Our present understanding of morphogenesis, of body plan building, indicates that new phyla, new animal forms, were not made by new genes, but largely emerged through the rewiring of the gene regulatory networks of already existing genes. Now, the term already existing genes ought to maybe make alarm bell go off. If you've got already existing genes, and you do in these genes, you notice he's talking about those gene regulatory networks that I was talking about, those integrated circuits of different genes acting to express some and not others at different times. What are genes? They're sections of DNA. What does DNA contain? Biological information. And what we know goes on is that the gene regulatory networks act on other already existing genes that have information for building the parts of animals. So you've got the regulatory system and then the information for the parts list. So Marshall's acknowledging both those sources of pre-existing genetic information, but he's not explaining the origin of either one. Moreover, he talks about rewiring these developmental gene regulatory networks, which is the very thing we know can't happen based on the experimental research on them. And moreover, if you did rewire a gene regulatory network, that would require multiple coordinated changes in code, which is a new source of information and also requires intelligent design. So in order to answer the information argument that we put forward in the theistic evolution book and that I put forward in Darwin's Doubt and Doug and Ann Gager have put forward in their work, Marshall has to invoke three separate sources of unexplained biological information, genetic information. And that I submit does not require a PhD in biology to refute. Basic logic reveals that to be a question begging argument. So I would assert that if this is the best that the mainstream evolutionary biologists can do to respond to our critique and to our positive case for intelligent design, which is not mainly the focus tonight, and I think Charles Marshall is the best, he's a terrific scientist, uh, then I think our critique is on very solid grounds indeed. And so for me, I'm very puzzled at this big push to get theistic evolution into the religious world at just the time when the creative power of the mutation natural selection is being so roundly and profoundly critiqued by secular mainstream evolutionary biologists, or in the case of people like Marshall, when they encounter our critique, we find that they're unable to answer it without begging the question. I think this is really problematic. So um, thank you very much, and uh, I hand it over to the philosophers and the theologians. Yeah. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. 
Learn more at biola.edu.